Hey everyone, it is Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Oops, your computer is not broken if you're hearing some music in the background. I took a little request. We've been playing some music at the top of these things as everyone's entering the room. So if you're wondering that little earworm, what is that? You think you know it? It's, it is, it's Wilson Phillips. It's Hold On. Uh, our friend Craig requested this, so we're gonna listen to this while I yak at you for just a quick minute as we have all our friends coming into the room. And if you've been with us before, you probably know this, but forgive me if I sound like a broken record. Here, do this again. Uh, if you would take your finger or your mouse, whatever it is that you use to manipulate your computer, go down to the bottom of the screen and you should see a thought bubble, right? It says chat, click that open. Make sure it's set so it says all panelists and attendees. Mine is preset for all panelists. So make sure you're talking to everyone, all panelists and attendees. And then while we're listening to Wilson Phillips, just say hi. And I give your name, your organization, where you're coming from. And then we've been doing this lately, a two-word second. So how are you doing? Lots of background, Alan. Yeah, I'm playing Wilson Phillips. Hold on. Uh, so we've got the Brian Wilson's daughters, and I can't remember who the third member is. I think it's Shia. I don't even remember who the other person member of Wilson Phillips is. Turn off the music. You can't hear it. Oh, man. I'm going to turn it down, and then I will turn it off. It's just a short song. It's a nice message. Hold on, Wilson Phillips. Um, add your names, bringing you back to middle school. Yeah, Kristen, this is an oldie but a goodie, but, but Craig has had this on his mind, so we thought we'd share it. Um, if you would, hi, what your name is? Hi, it's Sean. And then two word check in. How you doing? How you feeling? Two words. This is something we've taken from Professor Brene Brown. So your name, where you're coming from, in from, uh, your organization, and a two word check in. How you doing? Paul says, doing fine. Great. Lovely to hear it. Uh, other folks, as you're coming in, I'll be saying hello. Uh, kind of hard to hear, Cedric. I hear you. Jordy, how are you, my friend? Phil in Minneapolis, pretty okay. Uh, Allison in beautiful Minnesota. How you doing, Allison? Let's see. Rachel in New York, how are you? Aaron, Philip, Kristen, Robert, Carol. Uh, let's see, how a sleepy today. Okay, that's a good one. Lane, how are you? Ben, nice to see you. Energized and you're going too fast for me. Bruce, how are you doing? Okay. Cozy and comfortable, Nicole. Nice place to be. We're glad. And I know you're up in Northern California. It's nice to hear you're safe. Nora's up in Toronto. How are you? Nick, how are you? Allison, is it going too fast for me? So why don't you continue to do that? This is also going to be a space where you all can chit chat with one another. And our colleague, Carrie Klein, is in here. She's going to be adding links as they're appropriate for you all. So you can take advantage of some of the information that we're sharing. So you can look at that here. You can also, as we always do, this is up on Twitter. Our colleague, Gab Sarah Ferris, is sheltering down in her place in Washington, D.C. She is going to be sharing that uh, on uh, all of our notes on Twitter at the hashtag ComNetLive. Hey, Taylor. Hey, George. How are you? Madeline, how are you? Drinking lots of coffee. Okay. Ariel and Frank and Lori. Sunny in Portland, Maine. Kristen, I'm, I'm grateful. I just live in Portland. We're not too far from that. It's Colby up in Waterville. Uh, who else is with us? Katie, Carrie, Ellen. All lovely to see you. Keep chit-chatting with one another. Uh, so again, on Twitter, those notes are at ComNetLives, the hashtag C-O-M-N-E-T-L-I-V-E. -E. Uh, my colleague Tristan Mahabir is running the deck for us just now, and then we're going to pass it over to our friend Craig. Uh, Tristan, if you go ahead and advance the slides, we're going to go ahead and just tell you a couple quick things just so you're aware, up to date. This is hopefully you saw something you've seen. Uh, Dr. Jones sent out a note to all of us yesterday. The deadline is fast approaching. This Friday, close of business. Uh, we will stop the uh, uh, stop the applications for the Clarence B. Jones Impact Award. And the purpose of this award has been around now, this is our third year giving it, is to lift up and honor communications work either by an individual or an organization that has done something extraordinary and created change using communication. So in the past, uh, the Truth Initiative, the folks who've been on the youth, who've done the, just a tremendous work on youth smoking here in the United States, uh, and more recently, Desmond Mead, the leader of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, who restored voting rights for a number of previously incarcerated folks in the state of Florida, largest expansion of voting rights in the United States, use communications to bring that forward. We're looking to honor somebody like that this year, the deadline to put in an application Friday. Okay, deadline is Friday. Kristen, if you would, go ahead and pass it on to the next one. Other thing I want to flag for you, in addition to gathering in this context where all of us are coming in from around the globe, as you probably, or I certainly hope you know, we have 18 or however many it is, Com Network local groups. These are groups that are building community in the places where you live. 
So you get the chance to meet your colleagues and who have a shared culture, maybe some of the shared challenges or opportunities. It's a chance to come together. They've been gathering virtually, I think a little bit later this week, our group in Chicago is gathering. Most recently, our folks down in Denver, or out in Denver, depending upon where you're at, uh, gathered. Uh, Detroit has gathered recently, Boston, New York, uh, Seattle, San Francisco. And so go ahead and if you look at comnetwork.org, you will find a local group and we'd encourage you now, uh, you can gather with those folks virtually. And it's a little bit more like a, a Zoom meeting where you can chit chat and either learn something or share some questions or talk to one another. But we found this to be tremendously helpful and useful and supportive. So take your take advantage of that if you can. Uh, Mr. T, if you would go forward. Uh, and Carrie, by the way, just put in a link about local groups. If you want to find one in your community, you can take that link there. Uh, this is the triage kit. Hopefully you've seen this. Tens of thousands of people around the globe now have made use of this. This was something we built with the help of all of you. Uh, it was a collaborative effort, but it is, uh, we have taken uh, sort of best practices for what you might do to meet this moment, particularly in the emergency phase. We've also, and very generously, many of you have shared work product, communications products that you have made, whether that's an event cancellation notice or perhaps a thought leadership piece, whatever it might be, you've put it in there so that other folks can take advantage. You can go in and find these things. There's no plagiarism right now, given the circumstances. If you see something that's useful to you, pull it out, maybe swap out some names, change a few things around, and it's yours to make use of. And so we'll continue to do that for as long as that's necessary. Mr. T, if you'll go forward for us. Circles, this is the other thing I just want to flag for you. This is a new program. Uh, it's very long in gestation, something the network's been talking about for probably over a decade, so certainly before my time. But the idea is pretty simple. We want to bring you together with people as the network has grown. There's now 2,500 of us who are formerly parts of the network or paying members uh, around the globe. And what we realize is that's a really big group of folks, so we want to shrink it. We want to make sure that we can find the exact right people for you to be connecting with. And so in just the next couple of weeks, we're going to launch Circles at a, a sort of a moderate pace to start, and we'll build them up over time. Uh, uh, but this will connect you to people based on either the issues that you and your organization are working on. So you could imagine maybe that's health policy or social justice. You will find other people doing comms work at other organizations and we'll gather you that way, or it'll be based on the role or function that you play within your organization. So maybe you're a department head or maybe you're a sort of a one man band, one person shop. Uh, we will gather you in that way just to start. And then we're gonna add some more of these as we go forward. So that's circles. Uh, and Amanda's asking, can the triage kit be found elsewhere besides Google? You can find it on comnetwork.org, Amanda, and it'll take you into Google. So it's a shared doc and it is free and open to everybody. This is something we want to see shared widely. Again, as I said, about 10, tens of thousands at this point. So 20, 30,000 folks have used it around the globe. Uh, and, and I'm so glad that it's been useful to you. That's just tremendous. So that's what I got. Uh, you're now seeing Tristan and we are recording this. It's the last thing I got to say. So you might see the button up there. We are recording this. We will make this available uh, for replay along with some notes that our colleague Carrie is taking probably within the give us 24 hours, 48 hours. And with that, it's my pleasure to actually pass this baton across the pond uh, to my very good friend and someone that I deeply admire, Craig Dwyer. And you probably know Craig if you were with us in Austin, um, but let me just brag on him for a quick minute. Uh, if you are like me of Irish heritage, this is something you ought to feel especially proud of. Uh, Ireland fairly recently uh, created a, a marriage equality for the entire country and Craig played an integral role, an essential role in making that happen. Uh, and he has talked about that in the past and joined us for webinars, but it's an extraordinary story. It was so effective. And actually, as you can just imagine, I'm thinking of my grandparents and how crazy an idea that is to see my, Ireland make this tremendous shift and to do it across generations and across ideologies. Uh, was just an extraordinary thing. They were so effective that Craig was actually invited down to Australia to do a similar effort, which was also successful. So he knows a lot about digital organizing and bringing people together and taking advantage of this, this digital space that many of us are exploring in really deep ways right now. So with that, Craig, if you'd like to take it away, uh, thank you all for being with us. And I'm hoping you all are safe and healthy and well. Be back with you on the other side of this when we take questions. Craig? Great. <clears throat> thank you very much, Sean. Uh, so can you see my screen there okay? I can, and so I think everyone else can. So what I'm seeing is this virtual roundtable, digital advocacy versus during COVID-19. Yes. So that's cool. right, we're in the right spot. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure that that was there before we kick off. Uh, so Sean, thank you, thanks a million for that uh, very nice introduction. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation to, to participate in this virtual roundtable um, this, this afternoon. Uh, so yes, hello from across the pond. Uh, my name is, is Craig Dwyer. Um, I'm based here uh, in Ireland. 
uh, spending lockdown in the in the beautiful Kilkelly countryside. Uh, so it's really really nice. Uh, you know, I suppose making the best of of, of the of the, the situation at the moment. But yeah, so delighted to be joined with you all today. Uh, so the focus of the virtual roundtable is on digital advocacy during COVID-19. Uh, I'm the founder of, of For a Change. Uh, so uh, through that, I work with foundations, campaigning organizations, NGOs uh, on using digital and social media for progressive social change. And, um, you know, so I've been kind of like working on this for the last number of years. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as Sean mentioned, really fortunate enough to be, to be part of the team who worked on the um, Irish marriage equality referendum here in 2015, uh, when Ireland became the first country in the world to introduce marriage equality by a vote of the people. Um, and then also went down to Australia in 2017 to work on their campaign as well. And so, yeah, so I have been working on this for, for, for a number of years, but certainly, you know, even uh, I, I've been adjusting in, in the last few months, um, you know, and trying to, to help organizations and campaigners respond, um, you know, to, or to, to the pandemic um, and, and, and adapting um, and embracing kind of digital platforms to try and, and help during this really challenging environment. Uh, so that certainly is going to be the, the focus of the discussion um, over the next kind of hour or so. Uh, so yeah, I will aim to speak for about uh, 30 minutes and then we will open it up to a bit of a Q&A then. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned there, this is uh, for a change. So that's, uh, it's certain, it's essentially is this online resource for campaigners, for activists um, on putting together digital strategies for progressive social change. Um, so just what we are going to talk about then. So yeah, essentially, how do we use digital and social media as tools to, to help us to communicate, organize and mobilize? Um, and with a focus on responding in and adapting to the, the current environment. Uh, so looking at some kind of examples of good practice uh, innovation within the sector where that's been taking place over the, over the last kind of few months. Um, and then also kind of, I'll, I'll show you some of the resources and tools that I've come across that I think have been particularly helpful as well, that hopefully you'll be able to take some, some inspiration from. And uh, so just kind of setting some context then, you know, yeah, so the, I suppose the term digital transformation has been around for some time now, uh, you know, but I, it's often kind of like more associated with the look at the kind of the corporate, the commercial world. But I think, you know, as, as, as like for foundations, the, the NGO sector, the campaigning sector, very much undergoing its own digital transformation over the last like decade or more. Uh, but I think what we're we have been realizing is that that that's like during this whole um, pandemic that that process has accelerated fourfold, you know, and I think it, <clears throat> previously, whereas maybe it was a case for some organizations, you know, maybe a bit reluctant or just slower to embrace and, and evolve, you know, but I, I think now there's no longer that that kind of like we're not afforded that opportunity anymore. We have to fully uh, embrace these platforms um, as, as tools to kind of help us um, with our campaigning efforts. Um, but ultimately, I do think that this is a good thing because, uh, like, you know, as I always say, like, I really do believe that, like, digital and social media are, are tools, um, and they are tools that allow us to become better campaigners, better, better organizers, better communicators. Uh, so just kind of like, again, uh, helping to kind of like inform the rest of the session. Um, I just wanted to reference this. Some of you might be aware of it, but it's, so it's the Global Technology Report is produced annually. So these are the, the most recent ones we have are from 2019. But it just looks at like how NGOs across the globe are using um, technology for their, 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 their advocacy work. Um, so kind of like pulling out some of the stats related to the United States and Canada. So we can see, so um, over, just over a thousand NGOs responded to the survey. You can see a breakdown of the respondents there, the types of organizations and the causes or issues that they're, that they're working on. And 
so you can see here, okay, so 90, 97% of those kind of over a thousand organizations say that they regularly use social media to engage their supporters and their donors. And you can see a breakdown of like the platforms that they're most active on there. You know, so this is, this is really positive. You know, the, the vast, vast, vast majority of them um, are active in this space. But then when we drill down a little bit further, and look here, so you can see, so less than half, so 40% uh, have a written social media strategy. And for me, kind of like, this is a kind of a big gap, you know? So whilst you might be active in the space, I think without kind of like having, having that strategy in place, I think you can miss out a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, on the opportunities that these platforms can afford you in, in our campaigning work. Similarly, the same goes for utilizing an editorial calendar and um, for your social media campaigns, you know, so being able to kind of proactively plan in advance um, you know, and then reporting on your, your return on investment as well. So when you're kind of like putting the resources into your social media, being able to monitor and learn all of the insights kind of from that as well, I think is really, really useful and it helps to guide our, our work into the future. But so, but and just also just want to reference. There's some other like really positive um, results coming out of this as well. Like the vast majority do agree that these are, tools are effective for online brand awareness, online fundraising, creating social change, um, and that that last one there. So that 70 percent agree that social media is effective for inspiring people to take political action. You know, and for me, kind of like this is the crux of a lot of the work that I do. And, you know, it very much is like, how do we use digital and social media platforms as tools to help to kind of like drive action related to the causes and the campaigns that, that we are working on? You know, and I think a lot of that um, can come from when we do have those robust kind of like strategies and plans in place. Uh, so when thinking about digital advocacy then, you know, this is kind of like the plan that, that, that I kind of like tend to, to, to follow, you know, the, the basic principles for what a, what a strategy would look like. Uh, you know, and as communications professionals, a lot of you will be familiar with this type of process, you know, identifying your target audiences, framing, messaging, those types of things. But I think when it comes to, to digital, there's a couple of key things, I think, just to, to kind of highlight here. Um, so one, you know, so which platforms uh, will you use? <clears throat> Excuse me. Often kind of like a question that I get asked like time and time again is, okay, you know, what's the next new platform? Where are all the young kids at these days? Uh, you know, and, and I, my response is always like, okay, well, where, like, where are you active? Like, you know, what platforms are you using and are you getting the most out of those? You know, see, and you might kind of like want to focus your, your, your efforts there uh, before, you know, moving to other platforms and spreading your resources too thinly. Also, I think your choice of platforms really need to be informed by particularly the, the other stages, the first two stages there. So actually, what are your aims? What are you trying to achieve? And who are your target audiences? So if you're primarily targeting and trying to mobilize young people, well, then, you know, you, you might want to be active on Instagram and thinking about TikTok, for example, you know, so that like those stages will inform where where you're going to be most active and where you should be what what you should be prioritizing and allocating resources towards and also then just like your 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 content strategy as well so making sure that you like you know not only are the, the platforms kind of uh, evolving constantly, but also how audiences consume and communicate, like consume content and can communicate on the platforms is always evolving and adapting as well. So I think being able to, to stay on top of that as much as possible as well, you know, so uh, video content at the moment is really kind of like booming, you know, short form, so short videos uh, that gets your message across, you know, so people's attention spans ever decreasing. Those types of things, really, really important when communicating uh, with audiences um, on, on digital platforms. And then, so thinking about, back to that point about using these, these as tools to drive action, how will you engage your audiences? Really, really important. So ensuring that, you know, where, where as much as possible, having calls to action um, in, in, in your online communications and thinking about 
different ways that people can get involved. So having almost kind of like a, like a spectrum of participation uh, for your supporters, you know, so no matter how active or not they want to be, they have a way that they can get involved and show their support. Uh, so it might be just as simple as, you know, signing up to a mailing list so they're kept updating us, uh, updated us to, to what you're working on, um, you know, or join a Zoom meeting, um, you know, whatever, whatever that, that action might be. Uh, and then I think one of the really big benefits of digital and social media is the ability to measure everything that we're doing and really to learn from that. You know, so if you do put put up a, like a video on Facebook, for example, you know, you 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 know, first of all, how many people are reached, but how long they watched for, when they started to drop off. You know, so it, I, like I think. The, the, the wealth of information kind of like from that is, is so rich and there's so much kind of like learning that can help to to inform our work moving forward as well you know and um, so and I think moving beyond the those kind of like vanity metrics as well around kind of say like just general reach and impressions but actually what counts as like meaningful engagements for for your organization for the work that you're doing um, and linking that to your calls to action and, and, and what your aims and your objectives are um, so that's kind of like that's the plan that i uh, that i have for designing a, 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 a an effective digital strategy and um, but i suppose like this is this is kind of would be devised in an ideal world when we have lots of time for for planning uh, but i suppose you know with the emergence of the coronavirus and everything associated, we, we don't really have that, that, that luxury as such. And we have been, um, I suppose, yeah, just kind of like forced to, 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 to adapt really. And I think it's important to realize as well that, you know, the scale and the pace of the, that adaption required of nonprofits, of foundations, it can be overwhelming as well, you know? And I think that's really important to, to, to recognize. Um, I came across this blog post on Medium, actually. So the, the headline of it, so going digital is no cure, cure all. Civil society must do more to adapt to COVID-19. You know, and I think like as a sector, we have been doing all that we can to embrace the disruption and to adapt and, and to keep going, you know. But I, 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 but I just want to read out an, an, an extract from this, this blog post, if that's okay, because it really did resonate with me. Um, so as it goes, our practice is built on the sheer determination that running a campaign or service requires and slowing down is not in our DNA. Whether you work at an NGO, community organization or union, the site is familiar. Long, long team meetings to rethink how you keep delivering on your social mission, inboxes overflowing with invitations to webinars on how to mobilize online, blogs telling you the top 10 remote working tools you need right now. For some of us, it's indeed possible to reimagine our models to meet this moment. There's been a lot of ingenuity already from organizations adapting operations to support rapid community response to unions moving fast to protect their members in schools and other essential jobs. Um, from launching online activist training programs to develop in innovative apps for their causes. But it's a mistake to think every one of us can or should carry on as a business as usual nor will the scale of today's crisis be solved by going digital alone. We all need to make sure that we weather the storm and make sure we are in a strong position to respond to the social and economic fallout that will come next. The article concludes by saying, now more than ever, our organizations have a responsibility to survive so that we can keep campaigning, holding our governments accountable and pushing for a more just egalitarian and healthy world. Uh, you know, so this was actually from a, a campaigning organization called Small Axe. But as I read it, you know, it did kind of like really re resonate with me. I'm, I'm, I think we are seeing a lot of, of ingenuity and in innovation within the sector, you know, but I like I, I saw as well a lot of kind of scrambling and organizations putting themselves under a lot of pressure to suddenly kind of like move everything online um, you know and I think that there is can be kind of like a risk of of, of, of burnout um, you know or, or not kind of like focusing on where your efforts are best placed in that type of of um, frame of mind you know so it's okay to just to kind of like 
take a step back um, and reassess, you know, so there's a couple of, of questions here to, or like a couple of things to be thinking about instead. See, what is achievable? How can we add value during this time? Um, and how best can we prepare, you know, for, for what's kind of coming next as well. So really use this time to re-strategize, you know. Um, and if you do decide to press pause uh, on certain actions for the moment, remember that, you know, the time will come again for you to work on these issues in, in, the, in the future. And, you know, hopefully with an even stronger base of supporters as well. But figure out what's needed now, uh, respond to immediate concerns, but then like plan for more longer term systemic change into the future as well. You know, uh, I, I think it's exactly now when we see firsthand how quickly things can change, uh, you know, and it's, it's time to think about kind of crisis preparedness in general, I think as well, you know. Uh, another thing I would say, you know, unfortunately what we have seen during this period is as well is, is how disproportionately affected the more vulnerable in, in our society are as well. So migrants, homeless, working class, women and children who are su subjected to violence and, and many other groups as well, you know, and, and the, the gaps in, in, in the gaps in society are widening and, and I think people are paying attention. But I think what won't be allowed to happen is for things to go back to how they were, you know, there, there's, there's no going back. Um, I imagine for, for a lot of us, you know, what we've seen is how things that apparently couldn't be done and um, issues that we've been kind of campaigning on for years suddenly happen overnight. I know certainly kind of like in Ireland, things like rent freezes or uh, access to healthcare for migrants and, and so on, you know, like those things have become a reality, you know, so I think it's important to kind of like recognize that as well. And, you know, as we are re-strategizing, uh, think about how we ensure that this doesn't roll back as well. So building the support and the engagement for that now, putting all of the structures and plans in place so when the time comes that we're ready to, to capitalise uh, on that opportunity at the right time. And I think, you know, when we are kind of like responding at the moment, uh, you know, I think it's, it's really, really important as well to, to, to keep these things in mind. Uh, first of all, being re being sensitive to the situation, you know, and this is a bit of a balance, you know, because in a way, the show must go on, you know, and there are important issues that we need to be talking about. Um, but I think just being conscious as well that many people are still struggling in a way, you know, concerned about their 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 loved ones and so on. Um, you know, so just being seen, like not to, to to just be conscious of that, um, and making sure that that the tone of what you're campaigning on um, takes into consideration those concerns that people still have. Um, and thinking about our our shared our shared values uh, and our shared humanity, I think that this is really a time where we are exuding and we're really demonstrating solidarity across kind of like uh, different different groups um you know different sectors of, of our society and, and we're really kind of coming together and looking after each other as well so where we can kind of like support others in their efforts as well um, i think let's let's do that uh, also, like the the importance of, of, of framing as well. I, I I think you've covered it framing in a previous virtual roundtables that that you've done and with through the communications network as well. Uh, but just kind of wanted to to touch on this as uh, my, myself as well. Uh, so yeah, I think like. I was kind of trying to think of, of framing during COVID as being a bit like a, having an arc. Uh, you know, so I think we need to be thinking of different kinds of frames and different narratives for the different stages of, of the pandemic as well. You know, so I, I think in the beginning, we were seeing frames and, and messages that made fe people feel reassured, supported, connected, uh, you know, and, and like stories of like local action, mutual um, aid groups, those kind of things. Um, and, and I think that was really, really Im important as well. But and then moving into the middle, it's more stories of kindness. Um, and, and, and I think, again, being conscious that we're still in the middle of this as well, and people are, are feeling the impact of it. And, and that's kind of taken its toll on many people as well, you know. Um, but then 
there will be an end phase. And I, I think I think ideally we'd all like to think that we're in the end phase now, but I think it's, it's probably a case of maybe in the middle looking to move towards the, the end phase. Um, but, I, but I think for, for us as a, as, as a sector, the end phase is going to be kind of like really, really important, you know, and it might be an ongoing end phase, but people will start looking for uh, more kind of like hope. Um, and I think that that's where we can have kind of like real impact in our, in our communications as well, you know. Um, so I think that this like this end phase um, with, is a time for framing and messages that that really motivate, galvanize and inspire people as well, you know, and it's a time for for new structures, new behaviors and new mindsets when we're kind of coming out of, of this dark time. And as I said, kind of like not rolling back on on, on kind of I'm not going back to, to things as, as they were done in the past. Uh, so I, yeah, I came across this another great blog post. I am on, on Medium again from um, Dave Algoso. Uh, this is on the challenge of of adapting, and you know how most of us kind of working on on social change issues. So you know we're required to to adapt personally as well you know so working from home switching to virtual meetings balancing childcare, all of those things but alongside of that tr transition we're also turning our attention to adjusting our work as well you know and 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 the difficulty um in that but i uh, and, and i think responding to that dave suggests a bit of a model to use as uh, for for wrapping rapid planning um, in in this moment of of uncertainty, so there are two two dimensions to this: the the, the planning level, so uh, strategy, programs, and operations, and then the time horizons uh, now, next, um, and later as well. So thinking of that kind of the the, the framing, the three stages of framing, um, and then matching that to this type of a plan might help in in kind of like how we do kind of approach our our work over the coming period as well. So uh, yeah, and, and just like there's no going back on some of the changes that have happened during the crisis, I think there's also an opportunity now to rethink what we're doing um, and how we do our work. Um, and to think outside of the box and to think outside the, the, the digital box as well. Uh, you know, digital campaigning, and I'm sure many on this call are, are, are you know, have been um, utilizing digital campaigning over the last number of years and have used tactics like online petitions or, you know, email your senator, congressman campaigns. Um, and I think, you know, while these have their place and they can be very effective, I think we, we need to think about what creative new strategies that we and, and tactics that we can use to really generate some meaningful participation in I think what's going to be a more crowded digital landscape, you know, so I think we are going to see and have been seeing kind of like a lot more kind of like say online petition campaigns and and, and email your, your senator campaign. Well, I know kind of like at, at, on this side of the pond, we have been anyway. And um, so that that's going to become an even more crowded space. So I think we need to think a little bit more creatively about how we do approach that. Um, you know, and I've, I've actually done a similar training here for, for a group here recently. And I was talking about the collaboration or the partnership between the communications network and IDEO as kind of like a good example of this and trying to, you know, think like trying to match up, say, uh, foundations, campaigning organizations with kind of creatives and people who have those kind of skills that they can bring, technologists. Uh, so you know, often we have we have the, the vision, we know what we want to achieve, we know the message, but there's this kind of like the, those creative skills to, to bring that to new audiences in these new creative ways is often kind of like where we're lacking. Um, so I think, you know, being able to, 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 to try and think, okay, how do we bring in these skills, uh, you know, and, and to really to think, and first of all, think more creatively about how we approach it, but then bring in the skills to achieve that as well, I think is really, really important. 
Uh, and I suppose all of this kind of ties into um, some of this, uh, this notion of a new power. Um, and some of you might have come across this concept um, already. And I know Tristan actually in the communications about this session referenced new, new power as well. Um, but this, so this was originally coined by Jeremy Hymans and Henry Timms in around 2014. So old power essentially, you know, is what we would describe as like top down approaches to campaigning. Uh, they would say that it works like a currency and that is it's held by a few and once gained, it's jealously guarded and the powerful have a substantial store of it to spend. It's closed, inaccessible, leader driven, it downloads and it captures. Uh, so that's old power. Um, but then on the other hand, New power operates very differently, like a current. It is made by many. It is open, participatory, and peer-driven. So it uploads, it distributes, like water or electricity, it's more, most forceful when it surges. And the goal with new power is not to hoard it, but to challenge it, you know? And like, I've been a big fan of, of this approach for years, but I think it really illustrates, I suppose, the, 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 the environment that, that we're currently in as well and where we can have success um, in the environment that, that we're currently in. So you might also know this as like networked or, or distributed campaigning, but there's just kind of like some 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 values there. So it's, um, when we're thinking about new power and the values that really drive those types of campaigns, so you know they're they're more uh, about self organization. This yeah, this networked approach. It's open source, radical transparency, do it ourselves. Uh, and it's really participatory and it's lowering the barriers of entry for people to, to, to get involved in, in these campaigns. And it's very kind of like people powered. So thinking of like, you know, uh, examples, Black Lives Matter, Indivisible, like the, the Hong Kong demonstrations, I would say is, is certainly, um, yes, equality. So during the marriage equality um, referendum here was very much kind of like that network distributed approach we saw our role, um, say, in, in, in HQ, just to provide the, the, the strategic leadership and, and the assets. But, you know, we had a network of over 60 Yes Equality groups dotted around the country, um, which was huge for, like, in, in Ireland. Um, and, you know, we wanted each of those groups to run their own campaign. So people in Galway, Cork, Limerick, they know what the best type of campaign, what that looks like in, in their own area. So kind of like giving them the tools that they needed to go and run their own campaign from the, the grassroots up and um, there, you know, and we were just there to provide any support, guidance and leadership that they needed. And um, so that that type of approach, really reducing those barriers of entries um, and trying to get as many people um, involved in bringing the kind of the skills that they can as part of that as well. Um, yeah, and then so I think we are seeing examples of that, you know, and I suppose it, like, this, it's not a new phenomenon either, you know, like activist organizations were already and it's, as I assume many on this call have been shifting to digital like communications and campaigning even before the, 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 the pandemic as well, you know, but I suppose the current crisis has rapidly kicked these efforts into, into high gear. Uh, and for a lot of us as well, it's about figuring it out as we go along and, and kind of like looking to and learning from others. I think that's really, really important and continue to do that as well. But, and I for one have been really inspired um, and encouraged by the innovation, the creativity and the agility of the, the sector at large over the past few months. But I like, I probably am a bit biased, I would say that, but I am. Um, you know, and like, so e efforts like mass gatherings, protests, decisions, you know, they're obviously out of the question at the moment, but I uh, like activists and campaigners are instead turning to like digital strikes. And, you know, I think one of the first examples that I saw of this was Greta, Greta Thunberg, encouraging everyone to move to, to like a digital climate strike. And not only encouraging, say, her supporters and followers to kind of just move to a digital strike, but outlined kind of like how to do it, uh, you know, and the steps to take. And I think that that's really important as well. So kind of like making it as easy as possible for people to participate um, is really, really important. 
So yeah, um, there's no, just a couple of, of other really great things that I've seen over the past while as well. So this was a piece recently from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, so it was on civil society and the coronavirus uh, and how new forms of civic mobilization are filling the gaps uh, left by governments to provide essential services, spread information about the virus and protect marginalized groups. And um, all of these kind of following resources that I'm going to refer to, I put them all into a Google Doc which I will pop into the chat box, which we'll all be able to then kind of like follow up on and read, read in more detail as well. Um, so I am actually fortunate enough to be part of the Social Change Initiative. So Social Change Initiative is this uh, philanthropic organization based in Belfast in the north of Ireland. Uh, so yeah, they're a philanthropic organization that supports activists across the globe. Um, and I'm very fortunate to be part of their, their activist network. But this article features 10 of those um, activists involved with the Social Change Initiative who are based around the world, who are sharing their reflections and, and their experience. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to reference a couple from, from, from this side of the, of, of the world um, and, and how activists have been responding. Uh, so one example is from a digital campaigning organization called Act Now. So they created this rapid response campaign calling for, for a local um, health-based organization company called Randox. So they had received 23 million in public funding and they were calling uh, um, they were calling on Randox to cease selling its, its COVID-19 testing kits online at a high price and instead to work directly with the National Health Service. And within a week of that rapid response campaign going, line, uh, going online, Randox stated that it would now work with, um, with NHS to provide the COVID-19 test. So kind of a real kind of like a success early in, in, in this kind of pandemic. Uh, and then another Belfast-based human rights organization called PPR, the Participation and Practice of Rights. They're really, really effective. I was talking to Tristan about this organization before we started. Uh, so they were a really effective organization, uh, direct action and, would, uh, and you know, would have been very effective like on the ground, in the community, very grassroots. But they've been doing phenomenal work um, at transitioning and, and, and organizing online as well. Uh, so you'll find kind of like more information about their, their, their efforts in that article that I referenced. So this was a, a, this was an article that I originally came across in the in the Guardian about you know new forms of activism and how they are flourishing you know it details certain things so like in Chile how women have launched a feminist um, uh, emergency plan that includes coordinating caring duties and mu mutual support against gender based violence and many many others um, but I learned then that this was part of this this wider initiative um, from what's called the, the, the crowd counting collective. And um, so they're crowdsourcing many forms of collective action and dissent that are occurring across the world um, in the context of the global pandemic. Um, you know, so at the time of writing the, the article, they, they, they were at about a hundred distinct methods um, of kind of dissent and collective action during the, the, the pandemic. But that's kind of grown now to 142 the last time I checked. So it's really, really interesting as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I would encourage you to take a look. So it's just this kind of like online spreadsheet of all of these different um, initiatives and how they are doing, how they are doing it as well and providing examples of that tactic or that, that method in practice. Uh, so definitely worth, worth checking that out. Many of you will be aware of the, the political scientist, theorist, author, Gene Sharp, and his 198 methods of, of non-violent action. Um, Sharp initially put this list together saying, wise strategy, attention to the dynamics of non-violent struggle, and careful selection of methods can increase, increase a, a group's chances of success, which I think is every bit as relevant today. Um, but I came across this, another blog post by a campaigner based in the UK called Tom and Baker, who looked at this list in the context of COVID-19. And Tom categorized 30 of the methods as being, you know, out of the question, impossible to do kind of you know, during lockdown. He categorized 50 then as needing to be adapted, but could work in, in the age of social distancing. But also that, you know, that, that, that still means that over 100 um, of the proposed methods are still possible in the current environment as well. And uh, <clears throat> building on this as well, there's another initiative 
we call this uh, civil resistance 2.0. So looking at updating the, the 198 methods uh, on nonviolent methods as well. So the purpose of, of this is to revisit Gene Sharp's original 198 methods within the context of new digital technologies and social media. So how we can kind of like take those, those methods and adapt them for the digital age as well. Uh, so a little not not as easy to navigate this database um, as as the previous one, but certainly I think you know that there is kind of like learning for for us in there as well. So so again, would encourage you to take a look at that. Um, Realising I'm just going over the half an hour mark, thirty minutes, so I'm just going to finish up now. Uh, so yeah, just kind of like some tips then for your own kind of like digital uh, organising if you're kind of thinking, oh God, where do where do I start? And um, so I think, you know, using this time to really build up our, our online communities as well, you know, so if we're thinking of moving into the, like the next stages and trying to really kind of like mobilize our, our, our supporters and inspiring for the next stages, trying to build up our communities of supporters um, over this time, I think can be a useful place to start as well. Um, thinking of maybe, you know, uh, individuals within your organization or um, kind of like advocates, ambassadors on the issues that you're work, excuse me, that you're working on, trying to really kind of build up their profile and authority uh, during this time as well. So dem demonstrating thought leadership in that space, I think can be really, really important. Uh, relational organizing, you know, so this is the notion that we're, you know, we, we are a strong kind of like influence on our peers, on our family members. Um, so trying to kind of like communicate with those kind of communities around us, you know, often, like a lot of us are at home kind of like with our families during this time. And um, so encouraging people to have conversations with their with their friends, with their families, um, you know, around issues that are that are important to them as well. Trying to think about kind of like really clear and concise actions for people. So as you're building up those kind of like online communities, um, you know, making sure that when there is kind of like an action that you want them to take or respond to an ongoing development or something emerging that you're able to go to that community and say, this is happening. This is what we need you to do. Off you go. Um, so trying to kind of like have that structure in place really, really helps. And then, yeah, back to that reiterating that point around kind of like crowdsourcing skills as well. You know, if you're fortunate enough to have, say, like a community of supporters, like around, you know, around your, your foundation, around your organization, trying to tap into that. There's plenty of, of research been done kind of like around millennial giving, uh, you know, and people want to utilize their skills in order to be able to help out say nonprofits charities that kind of thing you know so maybe somebody is a really skilled graphic designer or can do some like video editing or animation those type of things where can you kind of like leverage um those, those skills and goodwill that people have obviously without um kind of like exploiting anyone <clears throat> so just kind of going to finish up then with some kind of quick resources uh, to look at so not just plugging my own website, but the first on the list is my own website. Uh, so that's forachange.org. Uh, uh, so we have plenty more information just in terms of kind of like the, the kind of digital strategy um, process that we talked through, some further tools and tactics, um, and a list of resources as well. So other really good resources just for general kind of like movement building and, and kind of online campaigning, uh, mobilization lab, neon, and then in terms of framing, I'm a, the Frameworks Institute, really, really good. And then at this side of the world as well, Up, Uplift are from Ireland. They have a really good um, kind of framing guide for during COVID-19. And so do the Public Interest Research Centre. Really, really good. They're the best. I've, I've kind of looked at a lot and they're definitely the best ones that I've come across. And um, yeah, just some additional ones then. The Coronavirus Tech Handbook. I don't know if any of you have seen this. It's so comprehensive and is everything that you can possibly think about uh, when it comes to kind of like tech and campaigning and communications and everything in between. Uh, 350.org, you know, it's, they do a lot of work around kind of like train, they have, a, they have a training hub anyway, but around kind of like digital campaigning, but they're really kind of ramping this up. Um, and one initiative they have at the moment is this thing where it's got ask a digital campaigner. So, you know, if you're looking, if you've kind of got questions around how you want to do with a little bit more of this, you can just pop them a question and then they, they endeavor to, to respond to that. And, some, and then just some other kind of ones there as well that I've, like I've looked at countless um, resources and these are definitely the best that I've come across. And as I said, I'm just, I'm going to, up, when we're doing the Q&A, um, I'll pop 
and this uh, Google Doc that have the list all these resources in there. So with that, I've come to the end of my slides. Hopefully you found it useful. I know like with those kind of different sections, we probably could have um, kind of focused on each one for a, a separate session, but hopefully kind of give you some food for thought for the, for, for, in your work. Oh. Helps if I unmute myself. You'd think I'd get good at Zoom by now. Uh, thank you very, very much, Craig. And thanks everybody for sticking around with us. We are gonna take your questions now. If you would, Ellen, I don't mean to call you out, my friend, but if you put it in the Q&A box, we will be sure to get to them and you can also vote for the questions. We're gonna try to be fair about this. The one that's gotten the most votes just now is from our friend Shanita. Shanita asks Craig, um, I prefer digital advocacy, but how do we make digital convenings accessible? The digital divide still exists and is likely wider now given COVID-19. How do we do that? How do we help to ensure that as many people have an opportunity to join us when perhaps now the answer is not walking out your front door with a, with a solid pair of shoes, but actually mm -hmm. being able to get online and join us. Many folks maybe in the past could use a library. Those aren't open right now. What do we do? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, and you know, I'm one of the things I think that we still, are battling in this kind of like current environment is that digital divide, you know? So like many of the groups that we are kind of like advocating with and on behalf of, you know, um, don't have, have access to like th these digital platforms, um, you know, even kind of like, I know there's a campaign here in the, in the North of Ireland trying to, to make the internet accessible for all, you know, so that digital divide is still very pertinent. Um, but I think a good place to maybe to, to start is trying to just focus on the platforms that people are familiar with. Um, you know, so like just thinking of things like, you know, WhatsApp, um, like Facebook groups, those types of things. So if, if kind of like communities are already somewhat active on at least kind of like one of those platforms, um, try and, and use those in the first instance and, and build the support around those, uh, around, around, around those platforms. Um, in addition to that, like I would say, even like I, I've been kind of, I suppose, encouraged by like how quickly like groups have say adapted to like using Zoom, for example, you know, so, um, I think trying to just identify those kind of like tools that people either are already comfortable with or you think that they will be able to kind of like utilize. But I, you know, I, I, but to, to, I suppose going back to that point that yes, even that digital divide still unfortunately does exist, but just try and think of the consumer friendly tools that are available and that people are already familiar with and start there. Thank you. And I know a big piece of this, obviously, is just getting information out to people, right? So many people, I think one of the conversations I've been privy to now multiple times is many people experiencing homelessness in the United States don't have access to computers yeah. or even a phone, for instance, and yet they need information in order to stay safe. And so these are, these are very real challenges I think we're all facing. Uh, the next question comes from our friend Aaron, uh, who asks, uh, I work at a community foundation. These are the regional foundations in the United States uh, that focus on a particular city or town or, or region. Um, we are active on all social platforms, but metrics haven't yielded high reach and impressions. Given that our donors, these are the people who give to this foundation and then hope to see that money distributed, given that our donors tend to be on the older side and less active, what would be some good tips to give to our social presence or to give our social presence a facelift in order to attract younger millennial donors during this time? What might they do to try to bring in younger people who may be looking to give back, whether that's in terms of skill or whether that's in terms of maybe just a small dollar donation towards a cause that they know about? And, and yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, I like, yeah, there's countless things that, that I could kind of like suggest here, but I say there was a, a good starting point would be to, I'd say, do a bit of like a review and an audit of your current performance. Okay. So, just looking back at your analytics for the last month, two months, um, and trying to like identify from within there, okay, you from the post that you have been putting out what has been doing kind of like really well or what has like not been doing so well, you know, and trying to maybe um, evolve the good stuff a little bit more. And then the stuff that's not really performing well, doing less of that, because it's really important. Like when it comes to say like the, the likes of Facebook and Instagram, 
we also have to be aware of the algorithm as well. So, you know, we want to be constantly putting out communications and posts that's getting good engagement and therefore you're going to appear organically appear higher up in people's news feeds. But if you're putting out kind of like posts that are not getting good engagement, Facebook will say, okay, well, when this page puts out stuff, people don't really engage with that much. Therefore, I'm not going to push it up in people's feeds. You know, so I would start, I would start there. Um, and then I think trying to think about really visual engaging um, kind of content as well. So like graphics, infographics, video, if that's possible as well, you know, so trying to like short form 30 to 60 second videos, they're, they're performing like really well at the moment. And that's even getting even shorter. Um, but those, those types of, of efforts, I think you will hopefully see a difference. Um, and then the final thing as well, you know, when it comes to social media, like it's it, organic reach is not the same as it once was, you know, the, like their whole kind of model has shifted. Um, and it is a bit more kind of like pay for play now, you know, they want you to spend more money in order to be able to reach large audiences. Um, so I'd say if you could, like if you are putting resources behind creating some of that new kind of visual content, if you could then allocate kind of some resources to, to boost that on Facebook, for example, uh, and then you can set a clearly defined target audience. So if you've, you've, you've identified, okay, yeah, there's this group within like the millennials that we want to target, um, you can do so through kind of like Facebook advertising. Um, and, and what that can do is just to help like lift your content. So it's not like, I don't think organic reach is, is dead, but it's just a little bit harder to get there. So if you can put a little bit of budget behind something to give it that initial boost, that's when organic reach can take over and it can start to kind of filter out. And um, so a couple of different, different kind of like methods there maybe to get you started. And along those lines, it just makes me think of the original social media, which is email. We all walk past it and walk into Mr. Zuckerberg's house, which is fine. Uh, but, but we all do have control over usually our email lists are people who volunteered. They want to hear from us. They're interested in what we have to say. Is there any, are there any new engagement strategies that you've seen that have been particularly innovative, maybe even just soliciting input from communities when we're all feeling this isolation? My sense is people want to be asked, how might we help? And getting and crowdsourcing <clears throat> to your point about new power. Any thoughts there? Yeah, yeah. No, no so like, look, like emails are, are still are really, really powerful. I suppose the, the difference for me is with social media, you're trying to reach, engage and influence new audiences like existing and new audiences where with email that's kind of that's the people who you have some support of you know some might be very supportive and they'll do whatever you ask of them uh, but then some less so you know would kind of just maybe depend on what the ask is um, so I think just being kind of like conscious of that in your communications and, and how you approach it is going to be very different um, and then, so within your, within your email communications, yeah, I think it's about thinking of, of that, you know, having clear, concise actions and recognizing that you're going to have different cohorts within that different groups are going to want to take like different actions as well. So having different ways that people can get involved and show their support and, and being, I think being as responsive as well, you know, so if something kind of like happens uh, that's taken off in the media that you're kind of quickly able to kind of like respond and get something out and saying like look at this is happening we need to respond this is how we respond we'd love your support this is what you can do great thank you very very much i'm mindful of the time are you okay if we go just a little bit over because i know it's also deeper into yeah. the evening in ireland uh, yes i am because but that's my fault for going over at the start <laughs> no, that's, that's quite right if you're okay we'll go for another couple of minutes so our friend cedric has a question that many people are interested in hearing the answer to and he says it would be interesting to hear how organizations have to adjust to dealing with declining engagement on facebook due to the pandemic and his question is has anyone else suffered a drastic drop since the stay-at-home orders have started in other words, Craig, has Facebook done something different just in the last couple of months uh, as a result of the pandemic or, or what's that look like? Uh, not that I have, not that I've heard. I'd be interested to kind of like hear if other people um, are experiencing that as well, just over the last um, coming months. But I would say, yeah, like that's just a general frustration that I hear a lot anyway, that, yeah, like they're kind of constantly making kind of like tweaks and adjustments, um, but also 
And I mentioned it during the, the presentation as well, like how audiences are kind of engaging on these platforms is, is changing as well, you know? So one of the things I think to really recognize um, with Facebook um, and social media in general is that especially younger audiences are moving away from this kind of like broadcast approach on social media. So like, you know, with, with the likes of Facebook and they're moving to more smaller private conversations. So that's, you know, we're seeing kind of Facebook groups, Facebook groups are like, they're, they're way more popular now than they have been in the past. And I would go as far as saying, you know, becoming a lot more popular than say pages appearing in your feeds. You know, when I go onto my own Facebook now, the groups that I'm a part of, they're at the top of, of my feed. And, and that's due to some of the changes that they're making as well, because they're trying to facilitate what they call more meaningful conversations. Uh, and we're seeing that manifest um, through Facebook groups. But also the likes of, you know, like Instagram, Instagram stories, you know, so that's that's kind of like how people are sharing and consuming content. It's not stuff that's going to stay there for 10 years time. And then we're mortified by those photos, you know, from 10 years ago. Uh, it's gone after 24 hours. You know, that's so I think thinking about those changes as well, I think is is is, is really important as well. Um, and also the, the kind of the types of content. So if you're kind of constantly say sharing articles and stuff like that, like I don't think they have as much impact as they did in the past. It is kind of the more visual, um, it is the graphic, it is the videos. Gotcha, and Cedric just added into the chat that his organization's reach has gone from about 1,000 down to 150, so he's pretty confident something happened. Maybe it is groups, but, but something for us all to keep an eye on. And then there's a question from our friend Sophie who asks, can you send around the links to all of these resources you mentioned? If I'm not mistaken, you just did. So, so Sophie, if you don't mind, go look in the chat and Craig has sent that and we will make a point of also including that in the page when we have the recording and the notes that Carrie has made, you'll find all of that there. Thank you very much. Super generous. I know that took a lot of time to pull together. So we are all grateful. No worries. That. No worries. Uh, next question comes from our friend Devin who asks, I work with several grassroots civil society organizations and grassroots activists located in Africa and in Latin America. Do you have any guidance on how local organizations with limited access to the internet can continue to hold governments accountable in the age of social distancing and where political and social spaces are closed? That's a big one. <laughs> like really important question. Um, I don't know if I have the answer. So that's, so that's kind of like, how do we continue, say, some off, offline um, kind of like methods of, of kind of like direct action during this period? Um, what I would say is, I, like, sorry, I don't have a kind of an answer to your question, but what I would say is to check out that database from the, the Crowd uh, Counting Collective because they do refer to um, other methods that you can still kind of like do offline at the moment as well. Um, I suppose the challenge is just trying to be able to still kind of like reach those audiences to let them know kind of like what that action is and what, what you want them to do. Um, and maybe that is just trying to, you know, think about audiences that you can reach. And um, so like, you know, like, you know, if it is kind of like younger people in those regions, communicating with those, engaging those and saying, hey, look, you know, can you ask um, others in your family to, to, to take this action or whatever that might be? Um, you know, so, yeah, I don't know if that answers it, but definitely do check out that database that I, that I, that's in that list. Yeah, I think the, the name of the game here is adaptation, that if you are not, if you are physically distanced from others, then gathering in mass groups is just yeah. going to be difficult, realistically, uh, whatever the context, whether that's a sporting event or a conference or a, or a political action. Um, our friend Pamela just asked this, so I want to make sure we get to it because she's still with us. Uh, can you discuss using live streams like Instagram Live or LinkedIn Live? Have you had any experience there? And, and what's the value of those things? Is it something you recommend? Um. They can be, they can be very effective, but when they are kind of like designed for audience participation, um, that's when they are kind of like most interactive, most engaging. Um, too often I would see, you know, and this was, I suppose this was kind of like in the, the pre-COVID days, but you would see kind of like um, kind of groups live streaming an event that was taking place, but 
that that's not really engaging and people are not going to 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 stay tuned in and um, if you think about it like you need to provide value for the audiences and um, like that that come across the live streams on the platform and um, so i would say yeah but just think it through and have a plan in place so be it like a q and a you know trying to get as much kind of like questions um, in, in advance, you know, so when you go live, you have some kind of questions to, to get you going um, and then more people will join and ask questions. Um, but, you know, it needs to be, I think it needs to be interactive uh, and it needs to be kind of like well thought through, but I think it can have, it can have huge value. Like we could have done this uh, through like Facebook live, for example, you know what I mean? So, so yeah, it can be, it just depends on, on what your approach is and just thinking of that, that engagement and value added piece. Our next question comes from our friend Aaron and she says, I work at a food bank where we're receiving unprecedented earned media. So the, the local media is paying attention and web traffic. So earned media and web traffic. What's the best way to convert those who are now aware of and supportive of our work and our mission to turn them into advocates for related policies? So around food security or, or hunger or some of those things. How might you take people who are recently learning about your organization, have perhaps encountered it online, maybe they saw it in a local paper online. Uh, how, do you, how do you turn those into converts? How do you turn those into supporters? Yeah, so the, like this is a really good question. Um, and you might have come across or heard of like, you know, like say like the funneling of engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of like what springs to mind here. Um, but I think what I try and uh, are the, the kind of the format that I try and have in place is, you know, so first of all, you're trying to to articulate the issue in the most kind of like compelling um, and authentic way. So it sounds like, you know, you've 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 done that. Right. Um, and then it's about kind of like demonstrating. Or so say, you know, you're engaged to them, but then it's, it's maybe articulate or communicating those additional um, pieces of work that you're doing to address the, the more, the broader issue, okay? But, and then kind of like appealing to their values within that as well, uh, showing them how kind of like things can improve and then what they can do to, to improve that, okay? So it always kind of like goes down to what action do, can they take? But it's, so it was when you kind of like first have the engagement, drawing them in a little bit further and they need to be able to kind of like connect to the issue in a way that they relate to and then I think they do need to kind of see then how, how can this improve, you know? So it's not, it's not that it's all bad. It's bad, but this is how it can get better. And this the solutions is, oriented. Yes. Solutions oriented. This is what we're doing to, to do that. Here's how you can help. Gotcha. Our friend Maisha asks, and, and a related question. So again, kind of around food. I work with communities via urban farming and would like to know how to get participatory engagement across intergenerational populations who may have technology uh, barriers or experiences. How do we get people online? And this is related. Maybe I can just add, there's a question from our friend Melissa that's somewhat related. Do you have any ideas on how to bring in an audience that has been primarily offline and bring them into the digital space? So it's not a matter of just bringing in people who are familiar with Facebook, but literally introducing people to some of these tools. And in her case, Melissa's case, she says, many of our donors stay in touch with us through more analog or traditional methods. And we're thinking about how to pull them into the digital landscape. How can, how might you do that to take people who have just traditionally not been participating, whether that's Maisha's community or whether it's Melissa's, how do we bring them in when, you know, we're all suddenly doing family Zoom meetings or whatever it might yeah, be? Yeah. What might we do to bring them into our, our spaces? But I think, I think you kind of, you, 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 you referred to it there, you know, we are, we're having kind of like family Zooms and, and things like that. So I suppose we're back to kind of like the digital divide thing, you know, and this is something that I'm thinking about as well, but you know, and it is, it continues to be a challenge, but you know, what I am seeing, and I suppose what I'm drawing kind of like inspiration from is that, you know, like we're hearing about like grandparents doing FaceTiming and, you know, all this, you know, where they hadn't done previously. So I think it's when you can demonstrate to those audiences that, you know, that there is a value to do this. It's, it's first of all, it's easy, you know, because I think that there's often can be like a, a, a fear of the unknown element in there as well. So kind of, I think kind of demonstrating, look, it's easy, you know, the, the, again, it's, it's, there's, there's a, there's a need for this. Um, and, you know, there's a value to you engaging on this platform, you know, um, but it is a challenge. 
Um, but I think it is just about trying to articulate to them, look, it, it, it's, it's not too different from how you're communicating already. It's just a different platform and it helps us to address this problem and uh, reach this solution. Right. And, and the point that you made a little bit earlier is maybe worth bringing back, which is for some people that digital fight is not just a lack of equipment or, or know-how. In some places, it's just literally, I don't have access to Wi-Fi. But you may have, you know, many of us now carry one of these. And so mm. there's the possibility of using, to your point, WhatsApp or text messages or other things, which many of us do not have in our toolkits. Others do, but it's a, it's a new and emerging space where you can have conversations, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and I would say kind of like just focus on those kind of consumer friendly tools first, you know, so they probably are familiar with, say, WhatsApp, for example, you know, so start, starting there um, and, and, and trying to kind of build on that. Uh, Sarah and several folks have said this, so perhaps it's worth noting uh, the resource page that you shared. Would you mind putting that back into the chat before we sign off and say thank you to everybody? And while you are doing that, I will just let everybody know we will be back tomorrow, Dr. Richard Wenzel, the epidemiologist and infectious disease doc uh, and, and editor at the Journal of uh, at the New England Journal of Medicine, is going to be back with us tomorrow to give us an update what we've learned just over the last two weeks. Uh, with COVID-19. So he'll be back with us tomorrow. And then coming up into the future, uh, Gene Sperling, the former head of the uh, President's Economic Council during the Obama administration is going to be with us in a couple of weeks. And Charles Vogel, uh, the author of a, of a book that has been very influential to all of us called The Art of Community, will be joining us in a couple of weeks time. And so if you just stay okay. tuned, you'll get invitations for all of those in the coming days, including Dr. Wenzel, which I think Tristan will be sending out to everybody just a little bit later today. And Craig, I see you put that in there. Thank you very, very much. Um, any questions that you didn't get asked that you wish you had before we let you go and then we'll give everybody back their time um <clears throat> well, i suppose if there's kind of like just one thing that i would kind of reiterate from the, the presentation or even or you know what i'm kind of like focused on at the moment is just recognizing that you know it's okay to kind of like take stock take a step back and you know we don't have to suddenly be all kind of like moving to to, to digital and doing everything in, in that online space but like th thinking about you know what needs to be done now where can we add value now you know what other kind of like groups can we support um, and ask those kind of like um questions and give ourselves a break and look after ourselves you know because you know we need to kind of keep going at the same time as well I think that's exactly wonderful advice. It is going to be a marathon. I know uh, if I can, last question to you, just in terms of, and, and thank you for seconding and thirding that, Eli. Uh, what's it look like in Ireland? Because this is a vantage point that many of us who are joining, I know there's folks from all over the world right now, so I don't want to, to in any way leave anyone out, but for those of us in, the, in North America, Central America, uh, what's it look like over there? How's it, how's it, how, how has this been unfolding for all of you? Because we know it's a global thing. Yeah, no, I, I suppose we, we share a lot of the same kind of like challenges um, as, as you are kind of like in all of your own kind of countries as well. Um, it has been tough. We have been, I think we're into like week seven of lockdown here and it has been a pretty kind of a strict lockdown as well. Um, but we're all kind of like doing our best to adhere to that. We are starting to move into a phased approach to, to easing that kind of like process now. Uh, so beginning from Monday, uh, but again, that's really, really slow. Um, it's, not, it's not until kind of August 10th that kind of like society as such kind of like begins to really open up again. And that's only if, if all goes well as well, you know. Um, but at the same time, I will say that like, it has been really heartening, you know, uh, I think there has been a real sense of, you know, we need to all kind of like come together in order to, to kind of like get through this. Um, you know, so it's so it has and people, people have been very good um, at kind of like adapting and responding and, and looking after each other as well. So really kind of like thankful and grateful for that. And we are thankful and grateful for you making the time. I know we've probably kept you a little bit from your dinner. Please send our best to your family. And we're grateful to know that you're healthy and well. And we hope that we'll see you before long again uh, online here for whatever comes next. And for the rest of you, uh, Sarah saying Zoom Gremlins at Work. Both links you just shared are for the comms triage kit. 
Oh no, rather than yeah, here, I, I, okay, I, I so have the link. I'll say it again. I promise everyone we will put it on the comnetwork.org page and we will get it right. Um, and Craig's going to just make sure Craig, you put it in for all panelists and attendees. So oh, everyone, okay. I've been doing that. I've been making that mistake too. Oh, there we go. Hopefully there we go. That. Okay, so there it is. And I promise we will put this on the YouTube page on comnetwork.org. And we'll also, yeah, be my guesses has shared this on social. If not, we will continue to share it. You can find it on the hashtag. Uh, Comnet Live, C O M N E T L I V E. Craig, again, thank you. Be well. I have a lovely evening and uh, just grateful to know that you are well and also grateful for your time and, and sharing with all of us. Thanks, everybody. Be well. We'll see you, many of you, tomorrow with Dr. Wenzel. And, and for the rest of you, we'll see you again very, very soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Cheers.